Hey, Walter Sorrells back with another Knife Makers Friday Five. Today we're going to talk heat treating. So before we get started with the main topic of the day, a uh, couple quick things. First, swag. Now, a month or so ago, I promised that I'd be giving away this little knife maker scribe to some randomly chosen person who signed up for uh, Patreon uh, as a supporter for the channel uh, during the month of July. So, that random Patreon supporter is Alec Duvall. Congratulations, Alec. Um, I'll be sending this out to you in the next couple of days. Uh, if you haven't seen that video, uh, I'll include a link here. Now, how about a bonus? Um, John Tedesco from Stainless Steel Tool Wrap sent me a similar uh, little scribe that um, he produces and sells through his uh, website, stainlessteeltoolwrap.com. Um, and uh, he's generously offered to um, uh, make these available at a discount to Patreon subscribers, so you can go to the Patreon page and find out details about that. But anyway, I'll be giving this away to Robert Venable, uh, another one of our recent subscribers. So. Hope you guys enjoy these. So I recently got a letter from a viewer, William Tui. Hope I'm pronouncing his uh, name right. Anyway, uh, the questions that he asked seemed like ones that might be of interest to a lot of other people. Basically, uh, the subject is heat treating, but he had some sort of specific questions uh, about that subject. Uh, I'll kind of skip his initial windup, but the basic uh, premise was he had watched um, a knife maker some years back do an interrupted quench, which is where you stick the knife into the quenchant, water, oil, whatever it might be, leave it there for a little bit, and then pull it back out, and then put it back in. So anyway, uh, here's kind of where his question starts. I guess the revolving questions are, is there any benefit with using O1, using oil for the interrupted quench? Um, is it usually only done in water because of how rapidly the water cools the work and what intervals or factors do I need to take into account if I decide to do this? So basically what we're talking about here are two things. First is the interrupted quench itself and second uh, is differential heat treating which is slightly different. The point of interval quenching and uh, I think William got this right, is if you uh, quench into water and just jam something in there, quench it, uh, harden it, it's really easy for that object, whatever it might be, to warp, and then that warping is so violent that it cracks. And this is all because water cools uh, steel extremely quickly. Steels like O1, which are considered to be uh, uh, oil-hardening steels, don't have to be cooled so quickly that they would normally be uh, quenched in water. So, to answer your basic question, no, there's no point in doing an interrupted quench on um, O1. O1 will fully harden if you just take the knife and immerse it in oil. That's all you need to do, no reason to do an interrupted quench. But uh, he was also sort of talking about if you put just the edge in, um, you can harden the edge and then keep the spine soft. Now, it is possible to do that with a steel like O1, uh, where you would have a uh, hard spine or a hard edge and a soft spine. The reasons for doing that are, are totally different from the interrupted quench thing. The point there is just to have a more shock resistant uh, knife. Can you do that with O1? Absolutely. Um, you know, the thing that you have to be careful with is that when you immerse the edge, but not the spine, what can happen is that you've got so much heat in that spine that heat can continue to propagate into the edge and maybe cause it to auto temper or to not harden quite as much as you would like it to. So, you know, you just have to be a little bit careful because oil does not suck the heat as quickly out of the steel as water would, you may not get quite the same results when uh, using a differential quench like that where you're just quenching the edge and then immersing the whole thing later on. All right, so this next question is kind of complicated. I'm probably not gonna cover the whole thing, but anyway, uh, I'll go ahead and read this entire question. My other question is about quenching mediums. 
Um, I'm a fairly big advocate of motor oil for knives that aren't used for eating or cooking, so I was leaning more towards quenching with motor oil. Um, when I learned about blacksmithing in Boy Scouts, I'd read that the boiling water molecules that sur surround a, an immersed workpiece can negatively impact the heat treat. So, I was wondering if a phase change like oil flaring up might create vague inconsistencies at a blade, or at least that possibility. So I've been trying to find oils that have higher flash points. Is that necessary or useful? Does the viscosity of oil matter at all? The temperature of the oil? And finally, if I heat treat and quench in motor oil, will it be okay to eat or cook with that blade once it's finished and polished? Are there additives uh, or in synthetic or conventional motor oil that I should be concerned about with for my own safety or for my blades? So that's a lot of stuff there. Um, first basic question, sort of all of the above. You know, every quenchant has its own unique qualities and if you heat it more or cool it more or if it has a different flash point or whatever, those all have the potential to affect the um, quenching of a knife. You know, in practice, are they that big a deal? You know, in a, a sort of a narrow window, uh, is Parks 50 going to give you very different results with a water with an oil quenching steel let's say as opposed to peanut oil as opposed to mo motor oil so you know the, the yeah i mean all these things have small effects some of them are not going to be effects that are measurable some of them probably are and you know without going through exhaustive testing of umpteen different quenchants on umpteen different uh, types of steel and so forth, you're just not going to know, you know, precisely, precisely how those things are going to work. So my general suggestion to people is don't try to try 8 million different ways of hardening things or quenching things. You know, sort of pick something, focus on it a little bit, and really learn to dial that one thing in. Which leads to the motor oil question, should you be using motor oil as opposed to some other kind of quench it? You know, personally, I don't use motor oil. It's not because I'm concerned that after cleaning and polishing and all kinds of stuff, there's still going to be residue, you know, of nasty stuff hiding in the steel. I don't really think that's likely to be the case. Uh, it's more that it creates smoke and, you know, uh, all kinds of nastiness in my shop that I would prefer not to have there. And, you know, given that there are plenty of other alternatives, um, why bother? If you're going to be really serious about oil quenching, I would recommend using, you know, professional oil quenchants. If it's more of a casual thing, I mean, in my case, I don't do tons of oil quenching. So I, temp I typically quench in peanut oil. Works fine for me. It's a recipe that I've kind of got dialed in and that I understand the variables. Um, you know, so, so I recommend, um, you know, finding that one thing that you like and kind of sticking with it. All right. So his last set of questions here. Um, Last set of questions involve wrapping blades in foil during heat treat and tempering uh, to decrease the amount of scale. If I'm using a forge and not a temperature controlled oven, can it still be beneficial? Can I use standard aluminum foil? Would I still be able to test for non-magnetism through the foil? So the general answer here is no. Typically people who use forges don't heat treat using foil wrap. Uh, the point of foil wrap is to keep oxygen off of the steel. Uh, there are two problems that that can cause. One is decarburization, meaning that uh, carbon is basically sucked out of the steel, softening the steel um, and reducing the quality of the steel. Secondarily, uh, it also creates scale, which can be a pain to uh, take off of the, um, the steel. So. Um, Typically, stainless steels are heat treated in hot in uh, heat in temperature controlled ovens, um, and those temperatures tend to be up in the 18, 1900 uh, range. And you tend to soak the steel in that uh, uh, at that temperature for a long time. Um, 
The typical kinds of steels, O1 being an example, that would be used in a forge typically are soaked at a much lower temperature and for a substantially shorter time. So the likelihood of running into decarburization problems in heat treating, say, O1 in an atmospheric forge, not so big, not really worth the trouble. Um, I'm not going to say there's, you know, zero reason to do it. I'm not going to say nobody does it. But as a general practice, most smiths don't use foil wrap. So personally, wouldn't bother with that. Now, should you need to use foil, you have to use purpose-made stainless steel heat treating foil. Aluminum foil will not hack it. The melting point of aluminum is actually lower than the typical temperatures that you would be heat treating stainless steels at. And so it would just melt all over and make a big mess. Got to use professional quality heat treating foil wrap. So I know these were kind of narrow and specific questions, but uh, heat treating is one of those things that um, is endlessly interesting to people who are really serious about knives. And more importantly, I, I think it, it, it's just the core skill set of, um, of a knife maker. Making handles, pretty designs, all that stuff should always be second to heat treating. So the more you know about heat treating, the better knife maker you're going to be. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!